Hello and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. Hello and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. This week on Fixing South Sudan, Eastern Equatoria accords a roaring reception for its newly appointed governor. And joining us in the show to speak about this development is Honorable General Luis Lobong Lojoro Loyanamoy, the governor of Eastern Equatoria State. Our pleasure to welcome him back to this show from the historical town of Capoeira. Sir, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Madinwa. How are you? Good. Kuniyai. Good job. You are welcome to the show. Thank you. Let me begin with the reception. Thousands of people came to the airport to receive you. What did you make of this? Well, uh... I think I was very happy, I was very excited to see that people turn in thousand just to receive me a Mayor Luis, who has just been appointed to be their servant. And of course, this means a lot. 
uh, it means uh, that that's something that people like in me, the people trust me. And, uh, and of course, they might have also have their own expectation. And I know the expectation. And with the massive popularity, as you have alluded to, there is high expectation. What do you think are the expectations of your people? Since I became the governor uh, in 2010, uh, there are things that uh, I have done. Uh, one of it is about uh, peaceful coexistence, security in the states. And I think if you have seen everywhere, when people talk, you, people, you talk about peace, you point everybody responding. So which means our people, the South Sudanese, are tired of conflicts, they want peace, and they want development. And uh, people identified Louis Lebon here in Eastern Equatoria, uh, to be somebody who is for peace, somebody who is want people to live together, uh, somebody who respond to issues about insecurity. And I think that is one of the expectations of the people. I think people were worried who is going to be, whether they are, they are going to enjoy peace or not. Now, after hearing Louis Lebon, and I think that was one of the expectations, that they are happy that you have come. And I've seen that and everybody has been talking about it. Uh, second thing is that uh, Louis Labong is also identified to be somebody who is also for diplomatic minded, and uh, and that is because of the few uh, developments uh, infrastructure uh, that I have done uh, in Eastern Equatoria. So uh, 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 said said is of course I'm also a very peaceful person. Uh, I don't harsh and anybody, uh, including my the politician, those are my competitive. Uh, I, don't, I don't arrest people. I leave them to play their roles. I think based on that, this is, that is what is the people are expecting. People want peaceful, people want services, people want development. Let me go back to what you have uh, alluded to again, uh, the 10 years in which you have been governor, there have been some achievements. Can you highlight what you have to show for the time period that you have been governor? In the past, uh, I think the physical things that people, you people can do, can see, in particular the physical infrastructure. Uh, I have made some remarkable physical infrastructure in terms of uh, office building, Office spaces, both from the from the states to the county, up to the Payam level. Uh, the remarkable one is the state secretariat of Torich, which is a landmark everybody can see, and I think uh, until now is one of the modern uh, building in the states as the secretariat. Uh, you can also go to the counties, uh, the best offices for the eight counties. You go to the Payams, we have we build about 24 Payams headquarters, the best so far. Uh, and plus other issues, so the roads and uh, schools that we have constructed. And also when you come to Capoeira here, I came without money and we started from zero. And if you go, you will see the offices where I was. Although it is not, you cannot compare it to Torito where I built, but it was, it was, uh, it's better than nothing. Uh, our parliament here, they have the hall where they meet. They are not sitting under the tree, they are not renting. And they have also their office, the speaker and others officers have the offices. And all that you build, on our own. Uh, and so, including the SPLM offices, uh, I believe these are the few things that a uh, can say. And what would you say about the livelihoods of your people? Have they improved? People need education, people need health uh, clinics, and if you compare the population, 
would you say what you have what your party has tried to do in the state is meeting the expectations of the people uh, to some extent yes sometimes back it was hard uh, to see more than 100 people in the greater Kapoeta going to school. Uh, it was hard to see hundreds or fifties uh, for four livers. It was hard to see 10 or so graduates. Since the SPLM came into Kapoeta in the 80s and, uh, and opened schools during the struggle, we have the fruits of the manpower and education. The people now, and some are ministers, one of them is uh, Joseph Napol, who started from Narus and, uh, and finished, and now she's a minister, and many others. And not only from Kapweta, Narus was the school which was accommodating all the South Sudanese people. And now they are ministers, they are what, they are ambassadors. And therefore, this is the fruit of the SPLM here in Kapweta. Surely you can say that modest progress has been registered, but much needs to be done to leave majority out of poverty and basic needs. That is true. I did not say that we have, not, we have done 100% or we achieved totally everything that people want. Just from zero, I was telling you from zero to somewhere where we are now, we have done something. And, uh, and you cannot change a society overnight. It is go gradually. As we speak, it was hard for the top to take a girl to school. Now we have many girls going to school. We have many girls who are graduates. And, and, and so these are all the efforts that the SPLM have done. And, and me also as an individual, as one of the leaders, have done. And educated the people, and people have accepted to take their children to school. Not many people get the opportunity that you got uh, to build on top of what you have already put in place. So what do you think about your second coming and what is the unfinished agenda? The unfinished agenda is to ensure to push. I cannot promise you that I'm going to finish everything. To push during this short time that I'm in, in the position, to, to continue where I'm where I stop, and, and also increase my energy uh, to do more. Uh, secondly, to complete the project that I have started. So the project that I started here, we have uh, the state secretariat or the defunct capoeira, which was one of the modern buildings also. And I have to make sure that I finish that during my time. Uh, and I believe by that time, we are going to have to revive the schools because so many schools are closed to a number of reasons. One is because of the economic crisis. Uh, uh, and two is because of lack of teachers and, and, and low payment. We are going to revive to see how we can revive the education system to make sure that it's attractive to get the trained teachers and how to maintain the teachers so that the education continues to run. We are also trying to, particularly the, the, the pastoral community, I'm trying to educate the top to make their wealth, to use their wealth, that is the livestock, and use them for commercial purposes, not only for prestige. Uh, and this is one of the second things that I want to do for the pastoral community. For the agriculturalist community in Eastern Equatoria, we are trying to encourage them to do modern uh, agriculture so that they be able uh, to, to produce more and, and sell it. I'm also trying to educate uh, people to often feed the roads using a manpower locally uh, so that we are connected uh, and encourage the youth to embark into business. These are a few things that I would will, I will like to achieve or to do during my time. And of course, Security, peace, and reconciliation is one of the best priorities that I have. To finish the unfinished business, there are many lessons to be learned from the past and overcoming challenges. 
and constraints that you encountered in your last reign? What are the challenges that you faced and how do we overcome them? There were a number of challenges. One of the challenges, of course, is security that has been happening in the whole country. Uh, the second one is economic, that there has not been flow of, of uh, salary for the people. Uh, and the economic crisis that is happening generally in the country. Uh, the third challenge is, is, of course, has been poor infrastructure in the, in, the, in the state, particular roads that have been places that were not been accessible and that you cannot respond to issues quickly. Uh, the force, of course, is uh, being the inadequate uh, trade skill manpower because the few well-trained people went to the NGO's world and uh, leaving the government. And therefore, the few people that you have, they will not be able to help you and, and, and advance your, your plans and do the work what you wanted, particularly in the civil service. So this has been the, some of the challenges. And what needs to be done to, to overcome those challenges? Because they are persistent, they are there to stay. Uh, well, we hope that we will embark on training, first of all, to train the civil servant. And probably we see how, uh, together with the consultation of the national government, to improve the salary of the civil servant so that we attract back the trained, skilled people into the government, into the civil servant, and so that they will be able to help in the, in the field of teaching, in health, and, and other uh, institutions. How do you do that when the salaries of the government are not attractive to them? Uh, yes, that's why I'm saying we will work together in the collaboration with the national government. And maybe also even if uh, the salary delay and it is limited, we can find a way and how we can raise locally, our resources locally through our taxes, to be able to top on the top of the, the, the salary of the civil servant. The last time we spoke, uh, in 2017, in Kapoita, we spoke about taking money out of politics and giving it to civil servants. This idea is still prominent in your mind. Is it doable? It is still, it is still in my mind, but it is not easy as one state to, to, to improve that alone, to implement that, and it, unless it becomes a national, uh, a national policy. But already, even when I was here, we were able to raise the, the salary of the civil servant, we are able to allocate them what they call uh, job allowance, uh, not really salary, because when you talk about salary, then you will be, uh, you will be, you will be fighting with the, the salary act or a payment act which was signed by the president. So in the state, you can play with the law and you see what is that you can assist your civil servant. And we did it here in Capoeira. And I'm going to see again now in Eastern Equatorial whether it is possible to do it or not. And let's speak about the economy, the local economy, the state economy, the economy of Eastern Equatorial State. For you to be able to do wonders in your territory, you have to do a lot in the areas of resource mobilization. We know many of the states are over dependent on Juba, handouts from Juba. Tell me about the local economy and how you intend on generating revenues. You know, Comrade Mading, we have resources in the states. It is that only that you we come with your policy, and there is security, stability, and the national government help us uh, to raise our own local resources. Uh, the reason why I'm saying the national government should help us because there are things that we think is the responsibility of the state. But you'll find that other institutions in the national government are interfering. And therefore, uh, even if when they collect these resources, we don't know whether the resources really go for the benefit or not. But if we are really empowered, uh, we'll be able to raise resources and we'll be able to pay our civil servants and improve our economy. 
at the state and we even do more development. Is it a function of political will or lack of legal framework? It is a lack of legal framework. And so what, what, would you, what do you advise? We need to engage. We need to, that's why I said we need to engage with the national government. So that those things that we think belong to the state are identified and the state are empowered to do so. At uh, your welcoming, some of the remarks were pointing at the mining industry, which is uh, a big one in Kapoita, and there seems to be feelings that whatever is coming out of there is not trickling down to the people. And you yourself said that you have taken a directive. You have taken a directive. Uh, what do you say about these remarks about the mining industry? That's true. The mining industry in Eastern Equatoria, as I said, and including the forestry. And uh, when I came, uh, the first executive orders that I did was to ban any forest for uh, uh, logging in Eastern Equatoria. Actually, an opposite, he was the first one was about mining, uh, illegal mining, using machinery. Uh, two was the logging. And the reason being that all this thing has been done, some of the approval either for the logging comes from Juba and from other institutions without the knowledge of the government and even local within government. the state, the state government. And also the, the local government will do also theirs without coordinating with the, the state government. And the national government. Uh, and the national. And the community as individuals also do the same. And all these resources, we don't know who is taking it, where it is going. And it is not making anything for the community. The same thing in the mining. Uh, there are people who have been bringing small machines Detector machine, they are roaming around all the bushes. Illegally. Illegally. Uh, and yet, nobody knows where they're taking. Uh, and even those ones which the government have allowed, they promise that they will do this, they will be able to do this, nothing. All the time they say, oh, we have not got anything, we have failed. Uh, and yet, people, other people from outside, they assume. Gold is there, or well, the state is receiving a lot of gold. And neither the state government nor the local benefit out of it. And so for, for this reason, that's why we, I, I decided to ban these activities. Waiting maybe for us to decide a way, together with the national government, how do we control our natural resources? This is not withstanding the artisanal mining that is up. Never. The artisanal mining is continuous. Even this artisanal mining, our people are mining, but we don't know they sell to who. All of it they sell to foreigners. And even we, we don't even tax them. So we even don't know what the quantity of the, the gold that goes out from this estate. When you talk about the assumption from outside, the assumptions are great. And one of uh, those assumptions was the report that was made by the Sentry, accusing yourself and your family of benefiting from the gold mines, and you made a counter response saying, what is the evidence? What do you make about that? People thinking that you are using the gold to enrich yourself. Uh, as I remarked in my reception in the Freedom Square, I was one of the people who I am happy when I, I banned this thing. And I wish that even this thing should not operate because there is a lot of uh, uh, the, the negatives, uh, negative issues about the mining. One, uh, the people assume, including the local, when there is a mining like that, whether at a small scale, they think that it goes to the government. One, in actual fact, it doesn't come. Two, the people all from outside assume that the state of Capoeira or whatever the government there, he has a goal. You are saying those. Uh Accusations are just mere accusations, they are assumptions, and they are based on nothing but lies. That's true. That is true. As I said the other time, uh, 
uh, as I said, was saying, that, yes, there are some few individuals roaming in the bushes, looking for gold. But we are not in control. We are not in charge. They don't bring it to us. And, and whatever is done there, they think it is the, the government is benefiting. When in actual fact, we are not benefiting. So when they were mentioning about my family, it's completely a lie. And my family has not, we have not found gone for any mining. Uh, and it was justified that some of, part of my family uh, had a connection with some people. They have registered some, uh, some uh, uh, what do you call, briefcase uh, companies that did not even go anywhere, did not even practice any mining. And so it's been a whole uh, uh, attribute that they have done something, which is not true. In this program, we speak of fixing South Sudan. What will it take to fix Eastern Equatorial State and South Sudan in general? Well, Eastern Equatorial has already been fixed. Uh, we are has only... Has it been fixed or is it being fixed? I am telling you, uh, well, you, you will continue to fix the country. There is no limit for fixing the country. We are continuing improving the situation of the, the, the country, and including Eastern Equatorial. And, and, and therefore, uh, we will continue to fixing, fixing until our generation, our children come, they take over and we will continue. There is no limit for fixing South What will it take to fix Eastern Equatoria? We need the law and order. We need the stability. And we need democracy. Uh, these three things, they will be, able, will be able to help us to continue fixing our country. Governor, thanks for coming to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Allah